Brexit, at the point of Brexit, there were some were asking or arguing for a Singapore, Singapore on Thames like uh, regulatory environment. This was the point of differentiation that we would have from the European Union. Do you think that in light of whatever business went to Amsterdam in terms of clearing, that there has been a change of mindset? And I, I'm mindful of the fact that you are a conservative mm -hmm. MP. Do you think in the event of a Labour victory that we would see either complete alignment uh, on governance or whether we would they would actually look to try and create some point of differentiation? Well, I'm going to narrow my remarks, if I may, just sure. to talk about financial services regulation, which is what um, my job is to scrutinise. And uh, clearly at the moment, uh, the main uh, trajectory is through uh, the reforms that the Chancellor outlined last December, which is the Edinburgh reforms, which is sort of 30 different strands of work in terms of um, re, re uh, looking at some of the uh, financial services regulation that had just been copied and pasted into into the UK uh, rule book from the EU when we left the European Union. And so there is a, a process that's being undertaken at the moment, and the regulators are looking at each uh, piece line by line. Um, and the Chancellor is obviously setting out what uh, the priorities are of the, of the government in that regard. Um, and it's a, a reasonably slow process, but there are, I think, definitely um, some opportunities there for the UK to come up with regulations that work better for the UK. But um, the view of myself and our committee is uh, that the UK thrives in the financial sector by having you know, good regulation and that um, we have now a bit more freedom um, now that we're out of the European Union, but we need to make sure that we have well-regulated, clear uh, financial markets because that's one of the great strengths of the UK economy. I think if I if I was to be or would want to be the chair of any uh, select committee, it would be the one of which or the position at which you occupy. All roads lead to number eleven. That's where the money is. Uh, if I look at the inquiries that are currently open in front of the committee, mm -hmm. sexism in the city. I noted that you feature in a Times article probably today. You might want to comment on that. SME finance with ninety nine percent of all businesses up and down the country being mm -hmm. uh, SMEs. Crypto. I don't know whether. Post Sam Bankman Freed, the UK takes a different view on what crypto will mean to us and our, whether we can do something there. Venture capital, which is obviously the funding model for a lot of the growth and enterprise mm -hmm. in the country. Quantitative tightening, so uh, whether the government is being successful in terms of uh, its push against inflation. Edinburgh reforms, you just mentioned, and tax relief. But mm -hmm. A word that I don't think I heard too much in Manchester at mm -hmm. all, but maybe less about that. Of all of those things, mm -hmm. the seven i think that there are mm -hmm. which you think are the most important the top three or that the government is either performing well against or needs to do better mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. well i think that um we've got to appreciate the context that we're in um on the one hand uh we've come out of a vast and terrible pandemic where you saw the Treasury step in and do things that you would never have believed were possible. And uh, obviously vast expenditures in terms of uh, the vaccination rollout and so on. Um, the economy by and large is uh, recovered in terms of pre-pandemic levels. We're ahead of those. Employment is ahead of those. Uh, but there's no question that that's been a huge hit to the public finances and it's been um, a hit to the economy and to world economy, um, where, which, you know, we are now out of, but um, with the scarring of the fact that we've accumulated uh, a large amount of, of public debt. Um, so that's the context in which all of this is happening. And uh, therefore, uh, I think you have a chancellor who himself has said that he um, you know, would prefer that tax rates were lower than they currently are. I think um, he's mindful of the level compared to other countries in the G7 and how competitive those are. Um, and he is also um, wanting to make sure that some of those legacy issues in terms of the pandemic 400 billion of uh, expenditure that no one was expecting uh, isn't passed on uh, for too many generations into the future. And so that's one of the things that's going on. The other context is, of course, this terrible tax on the economy, the worst tax on the economy, which is inflation. And uh, clearly, 
uh, it's got to be the top priority of this country that we bring inflation back down to manageable levels again. If you let inflation get out of control, you know, the game is over. You just have to look around the world at countries where that's happened and realise how incredibly important it is that we have confidence in um, uh, in monetary policy and inflation and getting it back down to the, the Bank of England's independent target. So again, Again, that context has meant one where rates have been increasing and increasing. And so it isn't a great hand uh, for any chancellor, uh, whatever political stripe, to be dealt. Um, you've obviously got to make um, um, some, some difficult decisions. And I think last year's uh, mini budget was a salutary lesson in terms of what the boundaries are in terms of the UK um, uh, not dealing with some of those those issues um and so that that's the context our report on tax reliefs came out um we just made the point that there did you know there are over a thousand tax reliefs on the tax system i see a tax accountant uh, <laughs> nodding wisely but even the treasury didn't know how many tax reliefs they are they only measure the impact of about 350 of them so there's this accretion of tax reliefs they've abolished the office for tax simplification and I think one thing we could all agree on is that our tax system is too complicated and we would love to see some of that simplified. So that's been an important piece of work. You mentioned um, the work we're doing on sexism in the city, as we've called it. Um, this is the sector in which the UK excels. It's a driver of growth for our economy, for the world economy. And there's more and more academic evidence that proves that uh, organizations that are able to make the most of a range of diverse talent tend to have better financial results and grow more and so therefore it's a growth a growth issue um, which we had as a committee had thought had been sort of sorted out by 2018 but we were quite shocked with the evidence we've had restricted to what's happened since 2018 to find out that it does still be seem to be an issue that is holding back the sector today in terms of its potential to help the U UK economy grow uh cryptocurrencies uh leon i'm, I'm i can be quite brief on that one um we were we were definitely at the skeptical end of uh the spectrum i think i'll put my own words on it i think they're the tulip bulbs of the 21st century um and i think that there's some good technology in there which will be useful will help to bring down transactions costs um there will be a role to play for some sort of central bank digital currency that will help you lower the cost of payments around the world remittances and things like that there's some there's some good stuff in there but um as far as you know you buying a particular cryptocurrency you're very welcome to speculate uh, with your with your vast wealth but um i would not i would not join you yeah <laughs> Well, a couple of things. I wish yeah. the last part of what you just said were true. Uh, <laughs> it is not. I'm told that there is a crypto bubble coming in the next 12 months. So we'll have to the punch. Get in, everyone. Get, in, get in there. Yeah. Uh, Leon said that. I did, I did not. <laughs> got you quite sure yeah. the uh, Treasury Set Committee. We do have a, uh, I think one other thing you said yeah. that was super important. I was not aware that there are a thousand different tax uh, relief mm. incentive schemes. Mm. And I think that from a, if I can mm. be critical of the government, Communicating that sort of thing, especially to the SME sector, is absolutely mm. vital because mm. people will not be aware that they can avail um, those reliefs. I think that there is one individual or an entity that have probably appeared in front of your committee a lot, which is the Bank of England. And there is conjecture around whether or not they were uh, responsive enough vis-a-vis -vis inflation in terms of putting up rates and uh, whether they have um, fully executed their duties. Do you have a view on that? Well, I, this is where I do have freedom as a backbencher to say things that um, that you would not expect the Chancellor or the Prime Minister to, to say. And I'm afraid, um, having been on the committee uh, since 2019, took over the chair last year, um, we've been seeing the Governor for some time um, after the pandemic ended. And I was flagging up to him as early as... Um, you know, the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, the kind of price pressures that were very evident to businesses in my uh, constituency. And uh, yes, I do think that the bank should have acted sooner to withdraw the excessive monetary stimulus that was in the system through the 
150 billion, I think it was, of quantitative easing they did after the pandemic. Once we were out of that, that should have been withdrawn from the system much faster. They should have signaled uh, sooner that they were changing uh, bank rate and they should have been clearer in their communications uh, that they would not let inflation get out of control because it's fed into second order effects, into wage demands, into wage expectations, into people's expectations. And frankly, they have, you know, let their remit that they 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 failed to fail to achieve it, and they have now recognised that, and that's really largely due to some of the probing questions that we've um, been asking them as a committee, including um, appointing Dr. Ben Bernanke, who was head of the Fed, U.S. Fed through the crash and is a Nobel. Laureate, he's, um, I'm going to be meeting with him in London this week. He's been asked by the Bank of England to do a review of what went wrong with their, their financial models. And clearly something went very wrong. One of the things that we've teased out of them in our evidence sessions is that they only look back at the last uh, 30 years since they've been independent for their modelling. Now, there are a few people in the room who are as ancient as I am, but there are there are maybe one or two grey hairs in here who can remember that prior to 1990, uh, what, what year was it, seven, when the Bank of England was made independent, um, you know, we did have energy price shocks and price shocks before then, which I would have thought might have been quite relevant to the Monetary Policy Committee and to see how um, they have used some of that more historic information to inform their decision making. And so Dr. Ben Bernanke is over here looking uh, in depth at um, uh, the way that they've been doing their inflation forecasting and their inflation modelling, because clearly, as they themselves admit, it, it did not work and it went wrong. Well, using the United, I'll exploit my um, responsibilities here for two more questions, and then I'll open it up. I've literally just returned from the United States, mm. where um, you know the Bill Clinton is the economy stupid mm. uh, mantra is very much alive, mm. and Democrats actually think that, irrespective of personalities, um, that will save them in the in the re-elect. If you look at what's happening in this country, mm. the IMF has said that the UK will have the highest rate of inflation and the lowest growth of any G7 country next year. Mm. So based on that, do you, are you a pessimist or an optimist about what will happen over mm. the course of the next 12 months in the run up to the general election? Well, we're in the States next week, actually. The committee's going to the States. I'm going to be meeting with the IMF. And one of the things that uh, disappoints us, and we've said this very clearly, is that the IMF is not able to come in front of our committee and actually answer questions. They're not prepared to have their forecast scrutinised. So we scrutinised the Bank of England's forecast, we scrutinised the Office for Budget Responsibilities forecasts and assumptions, but the IMF are not prepared to meet us on the record, but they'll meet us behind closed doors. That doesn't stop them, you know, opining quite openly um, about the UK economy's performance. And personally, they can do one or the other but you know they can't do both uh, they've either got to come and give us evidence on the record or they've got to you know keep a bit quieter frankly about their running commentary about the UK economy because their track record of getting the forecast rights has not been great and we would like to sort of figure out what's wrong with uh, with their assumptions um, I think in terms of the UK economy and the it's the economy stupid, um, you know, there are some very tough headwinds, particularly um, for households with the rise in interest rates and for small and medium sized businesses. Uh, the, the crucial thing is to get inflation back down in its box and not to do anything from a fiscal policy point of view that makes inflation worse. Um, but in terms of the economic, um, how people feel, um, my constituents are lucky to be in an economy where there are there is a great number of jobs. So there's a very strong job market. There are still nearly a million vacancies in in the UK. We still have a high level of employment. And uh, employment has been one of the big success stories of the last 13 years through the reforms to welfare that really make work pay. So I think that's been a very, very profound uh, change and uh, is an important part of what um, gives well-being to constituents when they go to the ballot box. But well, last one then. So mm. based on successes, so I think there has been a lot of doom and gloom, but um, I won't say their blushes. I see that open <laughs> banking are in the, the room today. Yeah. I mean, open banking is a something where we are best in class within this country in terms of uh, 11 million users, 600 SMEs have availed their services, they're broadening the understanding of what data opening up can uh, mean for business. 
in light of that, what would you want to see from the Chancellor in the uh, autumn statement and the budget uh, that is either related to the data protection, the digital information bill, or just broader in terms of macro policy measures? Yeah, so the autumn statement probably leaves us one more fiscal event before the general election. So I would expect this uh, autumn statement to be more steady as she goes. Uh, I think that there will be things that will come through in the spring budget next year, which will be more sort of uh, framed in the fact that we're about to have a general election. I think uh, you mentioned open banking. I think there are a number of different reforms uh, that are part of the Edinburgh reforms um, that uh, I would like to see, um, you know, moving forward. So implementation takes time. And uh, so a sense of uh, cracking on and getting through uh, those uh, many reforms, uh, there are about 30 of them in total, um, would be helpful. And uh, I, I think a sense of... Um, uh, how the two things in the, the major budget line items that are changing. So there's on the one hand, tax revenues have been um, somewhat better than expected. And of course, more and more people are now getting caught in um, some of these uh, uh, freezes to income tax uh, le levels. Um, so that's given the Chancellor something of a windfall. And on the other hand, you've got uh, interest rates which have increased and, you know, people worry about their own mortgages quite rightly. But bear in mind that the biggest mortgage anyone holds is the Chancellor on behalf of the country with the debt and that the amount that the Chancellor has to pay on debt goes up when uh, interest rates go up. So, again, points to why it's so important not to do anything in the autumn statement that could be argued to make inflation worse. OK, I think that's a good uh, mm. overview before we... Now open it up uh, from the floor. So if you could see, uh, we have some questions that are coming online, but we'll start in the room. Mm -hmm. So who you are and where you're from, just here. Hi, that's Simon from EY. Um, can I get your thoughts on the implementation of the secondary investment objective? I know Nikhil Rati spoke mm -hmm. about this in his management speech yesterday. Your thoughts on that, its potential at a time when obviously the UK is looking at the regulatory statute for the reason. Mm. Yeah, so this came in um, in the Financial Services and Markets Act, and the regulators now have this uh, additional objective to look at competitiveness. And uh, so it's very early days. Uh, I think that um, one of the things that we've taken on as a Treasury Committee is an additional responsibility since we left the EU is uh, we do the task that we used to perform by the Econ Committee in Brussels. So every consultation paper that comes out from the regulator, we now go through that line by line with our committee. We've appointed special advisors to advise us on what those changes um would mean uh, and in the frame of what are the statutory objectives of the regulator. So um, I haven't seen any change yet, to be honest. Um, uh, we do see the FCA regularly. As you say, um, Nikhil Rathi made a speech yesterday which outlined some of the way they're looking at things. Ashley Alder made a speech similarly last week, um, which set out again how they're going to approach the competitiveness objective. And so I think um, we would expect that by the time we get to the end of the year and the next time we scrutinise the FCA, that we will have seen how um, they're going to approach that and also how they're going to um, approach this consumer duty that also came in at the end of July. Just here in the front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marcus. Yeah. Uh, so excellent. Um, as a as a supporter, a strong supporter of the, the British plan, I wanted to ask you about <laughs> the performance of the, the British plan. Now, you reported a lot of inflation uh, due to a weak uh, currency. It's also a factor that due to productivity doesn't go up because uh, you don't need to improve mm. productivity when mm. you sell it over a weaker pound. Mm. What's your assessment in terms of exchange rates and mm. where the pounds should be heading? Mm. I can't believe I'm actually living through the experience of being asked by the Swiss ambassador <laughs> about, <laughs> about the British power when your Swiss franc is so mighty, so mighty, that at one point, how negative did your interest rates go? Zero, zero seven five. Yeah. In minus 0 0.75. So you had to pay exactly. the Swiss to own a Swiss franc at one point. So um, the answer is that uh, if we can get inflation 
uh, and the confidence that we can get inflation back towards the statutory objective of 2% for, for the Bank of England. And, you know, that is what is needed, because clearly, um, if you run at higher than that and higher to your other currencies around the world, that's the number one reason why your 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 currency will fall in value. Uh, I think when the, we've asked the bank about this, um, that they look at the trade weighted pound and not not always against the mighty Swiss franc. Um, uh, they look at the trade weighted pound and um, it, it's not been particularly weak or strong, I don't think, in the in the recent years. Yeah. Just there on the left, please. Uh, Brian Burns from Digital Moneybox, where we're saving and investing apps. So there's a lot of excellent work ongoing at the moment to try and get consumers to invest more. So you've got consumer duty that you mentioned, the FCA's consumer investment strategy, you've got ISA simplification, um, all pointing in the same direction. And we know we need to get people investing more. There's been a bit of a wrinkle reported in the last couple of weeks, which is HMRC's interpretation of smaller investors investing in what they call fractional shares. Uh, I don't know if that's come across your desk at all, but it really does seem to undermine a lot of that. So I was wondering if it had come across uh, your desk and whether you had a, had a view on that. I can confirm it came across my desk yesterday, and I can confirm we've got HMRC in front of the committee tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Bobby Keith from the Bill of Science Association. Mm. Um, it, the, the other side, is, which is the um, we're looking at is the PRAs, UK adoption of Basel 3.1. I'm wondering how you're viewing progress on that, their delay. And I guess, particularly, um, I mean, our particular interest is their application of an international standard for internationally active banks to UK domestic players. Uh, yes, uh, we have an open inquiry at the moment into uh, financing for small and medium sized uh, businesses. And we think that's probably where the Basel 3.1 capital requirements become most relevant and whether or not they're applied to building societies um, and or, or whether they're just restricted to smaller, uh, to, to systemically important uh, financial institutions. So um, that is something we're capturing as part of that inquiry. I think what everyone uh, wants is a safe and secure banking system but um, and a banking system that does allow failure we've had a couple of failures this year and I think the systems managed to cope pretty well uh, with that so they've been able to fail safely but at the same time um, we don't want the cost of capital to be so high that for small and medium-sized enterprises and indeed for larger businesses uh, this becomes uh, something that is totally prohibitive so that's uh, I think I speak for the committee in saying that's the balance we would hope that the regulator would set. From a good one. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm um, Fiona Sai from Goldman Sachs. Just to carry on on the SME point there, um, as I think you may be aware, we run a, yes. a, a very good um, program called 10,000 mm. Businesses, which is providing advice and support mm -hmm. to growing businesses across the sector. I mean, one of the consistent things that we hear from our from our small businesses is actually really that there is. You know, there's not consistent access to affordable finance centers in the UK. And there's a real kind of mm. information gap, which differs as well, or is even worse by gender and by ethnicity. Mm. Just interested in your views um, in terms of what you think the government really needs to be doing there. Yeah, we believe this is a very significant issue. It's something that um, looking at the venture capital sector, where we published our report um, at the end of July, um, you know, in venture capital in this country, for every pound that's raised in venture capital, and a lot of money is raised in venture capital, um, two pence goes to women led businesses. 14 pence goes to uh, businesses where it's men and women in the management team doesn't sound like it's quite capturing all the talent and entrepreneurial spirit of our country, if you ask me. Uh, so that is something that uh, we we totally um, uh, are across as a committee. And I think probably some of the same issues are going to come up in the small and medium sized enterprise uh, finance uh, report that we're looking at. Uh, it does seem to be um, not, and, and this applies to all businesses, um, a real uh, gap and that there are organizations like the British Business Bank which don't necessarily 
reach that that gap um so i think it's going to be a very interesting area for us to shine a spotlight on and i think um uh you know the government itself copied a bit that goldman scheme didn't they in yes. terms of and we'll be getting an update on how well that's working mm. just uh, i don't know what you can uh, over the next five years the board of companies will be the double investment to make up some of the mistakes of the past this is coming at the same time as massive investment in energy huge investment in transport housing as well as to some extent public sector education uh and schools we're bidding up against ourselves, uh, we're pushing up the, the raw material costs, pushing up the labor force costs, planning reforms, it's often being in the way of pushing up costs mm -hmm. even further. And and our engagement with the Treasury, that you know, looking at this from a macroeconomic perspective, we can sort of smooth those effects so that we don't get as many costs going up as they can. The difficulty with that is we get the can getting kicked down the road again and again and again. Do you see any of that in your committee? And is there anything you could do to sort of uh, ensure that the, the, the other barriers to that investment can mm. reduce mm. your planning and, and labor force. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm glad it is other committees that deal with all the planning things. Apparently, one of the things that apparently we're trying to build three new prisons as well in this country, and uh, planning has been one of the problem areas why we don't have enough prisons built. Um, uh, I'm trying to build some flood defences in my constituency and we've just spent a year trying to move the newts across into safe abode for the newts and uh, uh, so I am glad that our committee, you know, we've got quite enough on our plate I think without trying to sort out the whole uh, planning area but um, it, it, you know that's what I'm going to go back on voting on the, uh, the today is that there are lots of ways in which we can improve that and improve that experience for people who want to invest their own capital in improving the infrastructure of this country yeah Charlotte. Charlotte um, Cross, accountant um slightly covering in the sense that so obviously national national minimum wage is going up by 10 percent next year um so obviously companies have to look at cost control you've spoke very heavily on the subject of inflation mm -hmm. how does that feed through into companies where their wage bill is going to go up 10 percent mm -hmm. Well, uh, the level of the minimum wage is uh, set by uh, an expert panel which looks at uh, two things, um, the sorts of uh, demand there is for labour in the economy and uh, the um, remit is to ensure that uh, the, the minimum wage um, you know works in in both directions so we have seen some big increases in the minimum wage we continue to have a very strong labor market and uh we continue to have um uh, a lot of people who could work um and could work more who um need uh, an extra nudge and incentive to be able to do that so i'm glad it's people much wiser than myself who actually come up with the exact numbers um, it was actually, interestingly enough, one of the questions that we did ask the governor about, um, not this year, but last year, about he, how he was factoring that in, given how strong the labour market was, yeah. into his assessment of how tight monetary policy needed to be. Mm. Mm. Uh, labour um, yes, Party announced a huge amount of uh, green investment plan. But uh, it is criticized because of the, uh, it takes too much uh, fiscal cost. So how do you think about the future of the green investment policy? Yeah, we have done a lot of work on the, on the UK as a green investment hub. And I think uh, there's been um, some real leadership shown on this. So with the, I think we were the first government to issue a green investment bond. I think the City of London has done a lot in terms of becoming a hub for uh, green investment, certainly in terms of investment in the UK in, in green infrastructure like offshore wind. Um, we've been absolutely uh, at the cutting edge. Uh, does that mean that we still are going to need to make more of those investments? Of course we are. And uh, uh, and again, these are the judgments that chancellors of both stripes would need to make about what the uh, borrowing capacity is and uh, what the payback is for uh, those investments. And so um, I would expect uh, that to continue to be a theme as uh, the country is uh, legally bound to achieve net zero by 2050. We'll go through, we have a few uh, questions coming online, Harriet. So. Um... Going back to the EU theme, what is your assessment of the memorandum of understanding between the UK and EU on financial services? Is the joint UK EU financial regulatory reform forum 
excuse me, necessary? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a good good question. I know that uh, Andrew Griffith, the city minister, put in a lot of work on uh, that. Uh, I think um, the we also, as a committee, um, uh, meet with our counterparts on the Econ Committee. I think there will be um, room for divergence that both countries will take, or both uh, legislative systems will take different approaches at times. Um, but by and large, um, you know, you need to have a forum where you where you where you talk about what what you're what you're planning to do and uh, what the impact of that would be. So so you know clearly it's uh, it's uh, it's happening. We had a couple of questions come in about AI, which I'll uh, try and combine mm. them. So the FCA had a summit uh, not so long ago on the future of AI and financial services. Um, talking about the potential benefits and both the dangers, which side of the argument are you more convinced by at the moment? Yeah, we've um, we've we've not, as a committee, taken um, specific evidence on this uh, this subject. I think all of us um, every day in our financial services, though, are probably on the receiving end of some element of of AI. So you know, clearly. Um, uh, I think uh, it's it's here to stay, and I think that it's something where you would want uh, the direction of travel to be that it improves consumers' outcomes and the strength and resilience of the UK economy, and is an attractive place to base an AI business. Um, based on your previous comment mm -hmm. about um, crypto, um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> So the idea of a UK centrally backed digital currency or Britcoin was dismissed by the Lords Economic Affairs Committee. Um, do you agree with their assessment? So um, we are about to publish a report on that. So we are looking at the issue of central bank digital currency. The uh, current state of play is that uh, the bank has done a consultation. Apparently, they've had more responses to that consultation than to anything else they've ever consulted on. Um, and one of the things we'll be doing next week when we're in the States is uh, checking in with the Fed on how their, uh, their um, initiative is going. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I think there is going to be a role for uh, the, the technology. There's going to be a role for it reducing transaction costs, particularly uh, internationally from one country to the other, and that central bank digital currencies um, may um, be part of of that. So I would anticipate that they are likely to to happen um, and that they become a way, a medium of exchange for me to send my my money to Switzerland more easily or vice versa. Um, and uh, uh, and yet at the same time, um, I think that uh, is very different from the sort of speculative crypto vehicle that, you know, um, all too often lures people in where it's not actually backed by anything that has any intrinsic use or value. Big Swiss theme uh, happening here today. Yeah, Some, yeah, yeah. Someone else who I know spends a bit of time in the afternoon, <laughs> back to the room, Mr Napier. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Charlie Napier, co-founder of the Leon. Uh, slightly more political question. Are you mm -hmm. comfortable that uh, former Governor Mark Carney should uh, be introducing Rachel Reeves' um, speech in no party conference? Well, um, you know, it's a free it's a free world. He's a Canadian citizen and he expressed um, his, his point of view. Um, and uh, it, it, I think it slightly undermines the sort of aura of independence of central bankers. But on the other hand, I think it was already known, wasn't it, that Mark Carney was a, a Canadian liberal and aspired to be prime minister of that country one day. So. Um, so slightly different kettle of fish, I guess, in that case. Yeah, I think that's what they call shots fired. Um, one more question uh, online. So um, data is becoming increasingly important mm. in finance with applications such as open banking, mm. digital financial services and other areas. Mm. Will the new UK GDPR uh, mm. policy get the balance right between privacy and innovation? Mm. Uh, that is outside my area of expertise. Yeah, okay. we'll call that inside baseball. Um, uh, one more uh, from me. Oh, oh, hang on, back in the room. Back in the room, there, please. I've got a bunch of confidence. So I've got the guys from slightly else who got his uh, roof from that last. I was watching the session this morning on Facebook Pacific. Um, noted that there's quite a lot of talk about both representation in junior levels and senior levels. And on the junior end of the spectrum, 
Um, one thing that I've seen Labour propose is changes to the apprenticeship levy um, as a way of kind of uh, changing how we can recruit more like our friends and work clients such in the city. Is mm -hmm. that something do you think is going to come into your discussions um, throughout the inquiry? Please do submit your evidence. So stuff okay yeah <laughs> yeah that sounds uh sounds like the sort of constructive uh piece of evidence that's very helpful for an inquiry such as ours and uh and and you know we did have a very good panel of uh, practitioners this morning uh, we will um be inviting uh in uh, other experts and the regulators themselves and ministers later in the later in the inquiry but um i think we published our our evidence today and we were struck by how much evidence we got a lot of it requesting to be anonymized and something that i thought was you know consigned to the dustbin of history still seems to be happening um in one of the sectors that's the jewel in the uk's economic uh, crown so i think uh, there's going to be um interesting uh, things to say on that subject yeah Mr. Wyatt. Um, James Wyatt, um, given his complete failure, should Anthony Bailey resign? And should they actually appoint someone who believes in money um, to the monetary policy committee? Um, I think the principle of an independent Bank of England is incredibly helpful. Uh, it's some the one thing Gordon Brown did that I thought made uh, a really good legacy for the UK because over the 25 plus years that the bank's been independent they have managed to land uh very close to their target on on average um and i think that's because politicians haven't interfered in those decisions um other than appointing the governor themselves the who gets appointed to a, a single eight-year non-renewable term um the uh process is very hands-off for the government of the day and i think we would want that principle as politicians to be something that we respect i think that's what i told you i was good at not answering no, the questions good. i didn't <laughs> i didn't want to answer uh, yeah. that's both a, a yeah. curveball in baseball and a swing and a miss um <laughs> one more online uh online fraud is now the most common crime in england mm -hmm. and wales how does the committee mm. think banks should tackle fraud and ensure that customers are protected, mm. especially with the closure of physical banks mm. where people are moving mostly mm. or entirely online? Such a great question, Leon. And we um, have really taken a strong interest in this because uh, it is uh, something that we see in our constituency post bags such a lot. You know, people defrauded um, by there were these automatic push payments. So um, the government brought in legislation around that. Um, the payment systems regulator, whom we scrutinise in our committee, uh, came in and gave us evidence and a suggestion as how they were going to deal with it. Um, the, the proposal that they initially put in front of our committee was that they proposed to do with it, to deal with it um, by setting up uh, something run by the banks themselves and sort of outsourcing the whole process we felt that the payment systems regulator would need to uh, play a more uh, active statutory role there because uh, there was no question that in terms of reimbursement, the banks have been dragging their feet about this. We've always felt as a committee that if you, know, you erroneously send um, uh, some money to uh, someone uh, and that they're, therefore the receiving bank uh, knows which bank account that went into. Um, given how difficult it is to open a bank account, you'd think they'd have quite a lot of information about who owns that bank account. Um, that the, 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 the should they should be um, made to reimburse because they um, therefore will pay much more attention to uh, stopping that fraud. And I think we've made quite a lot of progress in terms of preventing push payment. But we are still waiting for the payment systems regulator to fully implement the steps that it needs to take um, to do this. And we're anticipating, and I hope you're out there, payment systems regulator, because you know that we're expecting this to be in place by the end of this year. Um, and uh, I think that will go a long way um, to forcing the banks themselves to solve 
uh, the problem. And they, they, they've done a, they've done a great deal, but I think there is still more that they can do. I yeah. echo everything you just said there. Even we, as an organisation, are constantly, yeah. almost weekly, on mm. the uh, front end of basically people trying to scam us and yeah. our staff. Yeah. And, uh, I know that the City of London Police are very active in this area, yeah. but in terms of the public consciousness about that, I think probably need, a little bit more needs to be done. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a question here around, quite specific around ISAs. Uh, the Chancellor has announced mm. he wants to simplify ISAs to get people to save more. Um, he's also considering, however, banning fractional shares, which could price many out of investing, especially those with limited capital, the, the young people. Uh, what do you think about that? And is there anything that you... Well, there'll be people in the room who know more about the fractional share. My understanding is HMRC is treating fractional shares in one way and the Chancellor wants fractional shares and is encouraging them. So there's a bit of a um, both sides of the organisation doing different things at the moment on that. I think we need fractional shares. I, I think I, I support that. Yeah, we've had uh, one or two more questions and then I'll uh, wrap it up. We've had a couple of questions around financial education. Do you think that this government needs to be mm. doing more? in and around that, I mean, I mentioned earlier, open banking, the public consciousness of what is uh, mm. available in terms of solutions and opportunities. Yeah. Uh, if so, what is the role of the committee in mm. this? Yeah, I mean, the, there is a lot more financial education in schools now from the age of about 14. Um, but one of my, again, this is not the committee speaking, this is me speaking, one of my particular bug bears, and I'm hoping that this is an audience where you'll, you know, talk of nothing else at your, uh, your, your your networking events. And that's the advice guidance boundary. Because when um, the retail distribution review happened back in 2012 and basically uh, stopped you buying a product where um, there was a commission paid uh, on that purchase and the advice was free and it made you pay for the advice and then there was no commission paid, um, it basically has created a, a marketplace, a supermarket, as it were, for financial services, where 93% of my constituents go into the supermarket and they're only allowed to shop in the sort of uninformed aisles with a lot of very unhealthy products, crypto products, um, uh, no information on the labelling, possibly quite expensive, very unnutritious products. That's 93% of my constituents. 7% of my constituents who are prepared to cough up up front for financial advice get taken into the part of the supermarket where you know, fees are lower, where the products are more nutritious, where they're much more designed for your financial goals, Leon, um, and uh, you're going to end up being much healthier. And uh, that is the marketplace we have created in financial services, um, where the average constituent can't get access to anything remotely resembling uh, financial education and help on the decisions that they're being asked to make because they've been auto enrolled into so many pension schemes and so this seems to be to be a huge area where you could um, find a better boundary between advice and guidance particularly using automatic in, uh, uh, you know as you were talking artificial intelligence can play a role it can take you right up to the point where you make a decision about your finances stopping short of saying and you should buy that product um, and it can help educate the public using online, digital and artificial intelligence and the few pieces of information they need to know about you. Let's do that. It seems to me that's a really good way to improve the financial literacy of the British public. Well, you must be answering the questions because online's come alive. Um, <laughs> so before I see one or two more, in the back, sorry. I'm following on to your point, Donald. Um, would you say that there's a role for other sectors to play their part in universities, bear in mind that a lot of issues that, that originate from the Totally, totally. And, uh, you know, UK finance, uh, they, they say they're, they're, I, I would put you in the category of the people who are trying to slightly drag your feet and uh, your your bosses won't like me saying that, but I'm afraid that is how I see the situation. Um, but I too totally agree that uh, Facebook and Google and uh, the other online platforms have an incredibly important role to play. And in fact, uh, it was September 2021, uh, we had them in front of our committee to ask about uh, exactly this, because it turned out you could Google 
um, you know, good investment and all the fraudulent ones would all come to the top of the Google search. And they kept saying, oh, that's far too difficult to solve that problem. Yet lo and behold, they came in front of our committee and that day announced that, that they had solved the problem. And from now on, anyone who was not, you know, an, a, a proper investment would not show up in uh, the search engines. So, yes, of course, they've got a role to play, but I'm not going to stop holding the bank's feet to the fire. I'm sorry. Yeah. One more. Yeah. Uh, Francis Small today has reported the thing about the recommended Prime Minister breaking up the Treasury, splitting finance from monetary affairs. Do you have thoughts on the merits of that? We'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, yes, we do want to see that. We've published a report saying bring back the Office for Tax Simplification. Yeah. Let's make with our five. A couple more online. Um, we are witnessing the turn to protectionism and industrial strategy in the US and the UK with the Inflation Reduction Act and mm -hmm. Bidenomics. Labour's moved to mimic this with Rachel Reed's Securenomics. Did the Conservatives agree with this turn away from free market principles? And are we soon to see some brand of Rishi-nomics from the Conservative Party? <laughs> Uh, for me, um, Rishi Economics in this regard was when uh, the Prime Minister went to Washington uh, a few months ago and uh, sat down with Joe Biden and they, uh, you know, I think the message has landed in Washington about the the, the potential harmless, harmful effects of the Inflation Reduction Act on allies and supply chains of allies. And so, you know, he sat down and negotiated something that really helped to alleviate and address some of those issues. I agree, though, it's not completely solved, but it seems to us, uh, you know, at this time for the West, the Western democracies, we've absolutely got to find a way to work together. Um, in terms of our supply chains, we've got incredible, I'm on the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, I wrote a report last week on energy, and uh, it's uh, uh, the impact of energy and what's happened with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the implications for security. And, you know, the, the, the there are some really pretty frightening implications in terms of how much of uh, the renewable energy, the green energy, uh, is linked to uh, the market share that China has in so many of these areas. And uh, there is also, you know, real uh, issues around um, things like um, people who build nuclear power stations. You know, a lot of nuclear power stations are built by uh, Russian businesses. So, you know, there are some real implications. We do, as Western democracies, need to look at a cool, hard look at our supply chains for uh, the move to uh, net zero because we are not currently in the place where we need to be. And we certainly don't need things that are putting up unnecessary protectionist uh, barriers. Um, Biden's got an election to, to, to win next year. So you know, he's got to reassure that base, but at the same time, we, we can't afford as, a, as Western democracies to fall into that trap again. In fact, I personally think where we need to end up is we need a world trade organization for, you know, Western free countries, myself. Mm. But uh, yeah. not, not sure who would finance that, but well, that would yeah. be regulated. But that's a yeah. uh, an ultimate question. There's yeah. a nice segue to um, obviously net, the net zero announcement was made by Rishi in Manchester. So a question related to that sort of. I think it was the HS2 one that was in Manchester. Sorry, the, I don't me. want to correct the week before. Inquisitor, but yeah. Uh, yeah. How can banks support households with decarbonizing in a costing crisis? Yeah, that is a great question. And I'd love to see more of that. So, um, you know, what I would love to see my constituents, who are many of them live off grid, you know, so they're reliant on either oil tanks in their garden or liquid petroleum gas in their garden, um, very rural area, West Worcestershire. And they need to have someone put in front of them the economic benefits of switching to, let's say, an air source heat pump or um, or also, you know, insulating their their drafty Victorian home. And that economic bridge is got to be something that's got to look a bit like um, a, a, a change to your mortgage to that to that household. In other words, you, you know, no one's going to stump up the massive upfront cost for an air source 
heat pump without being able to see the benefits of not having to buy all those gas tank worth and you know oil tank worths of oil and gas at the projected future prices that they're likely to get to. So yes, this is a perfect example of where um, banks and financial organisations can help individual constituents through that journey. And that's the why it's going to be really worthwhile for them to have the double glazing, the triple glazing, the insulation and so on. And yes, here's an easy way to pay for it. And it's going to make economic sense. £17,000 for an air source heat pump. So how many people in this country can afford that? And um, there's a seven thousand five hundred pound subsidy, isn't there? there so there is. yeah, so that ten thousand pounds has got to be put against the number of times you're not going to have to refill your gas, your oil, um, and then of course the electricity that won't be needed to run the air source. Yeah. Last one. We're at the end. Um, you are a conservative, and therefore um, I presume you don't agree with a lot, or if not anything that Keir Starmer says. But if you were advising the Labour Party and Starmer on how they should approach financial services, what would you say? Uh, we're a cross-party committee, so so what we put out um, has the support of the Labour members on our on our committee, and so we, you know, everything that we put out has that sort of cross-party lens uh, on it already. Um, I think that uh, it, you know, my personal political mantra is just keep the socialists out of power and that's what I shall be focusing on trying to do <laughs> between now and uh, the election yeah we'll, we'll use that as the tagline for, uh, <laughs> uh, for this event but um, I think that's a very nice uh, tour of all of macroeconomic mm. fiscal Bank of England retail and um, we thank you very much for your time and obviously uh, for the people that have, uh, mm. are watching online or in the room today but I think mm. if we can thank Harriet in the most appropriate and traditional way